What's wrong? It's finished. No data. No data, no problem. With the lowest data rates in the country, have extra fun with SLT Extra GB. The lowest rates in the island with SLT Extra GB. For additional 50 GB upwards, 1 GB is 60 rupees. 20 GB upwards, 1 GB is 75 rupees. 5 GB upwards, 1 GB is 85 rupees. For more details, call 1212. Tonight, a pledge to court. Commissioner General of Prisons promises in court not to execute any prisoner for a week. Will he be in trouble? MP Dayasiri Jayasekara shuns the Parliamentary Select Committee probing these to Sunday attacks. The ball is rolling. The Attorney General files indictments against former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahindran and nine others. On first at nine, this Friday, the 28th of June, 2019. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana first at nine. Mohan Sat ki pekat khalin, fair and lovely men devat passe, marks at vela, fairness vadi vela. Marks adu karala, oya ke fairness standard dekha vadi karagan. Fair and lovely men, anti mark cream. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammi Keknaika. Let's take you straight to local stories. The Commissioner General of Prisons has informed the Court of Appeal that the death penalty will not be carried out within the next seven days. Commissioner General of Prisons TMJW Tenakon gave this undertaking when he appeared before court today after being served notice over a writ petition filed against the decision to implement the death penalty in Sri Lanka. The petition was filed by Malinda Seniviratna today, citing the Commissioner General of Prisons and the Superintendent of the Valikata Prison as its respondents. In his petition, Seniviratna says that the President had recently stated that he had already signed the relevant document to impose the death penalty on four convicts. However, he points out implementing the death penalty could lead to violation of human rights. Hence, the petitioner seeks the Appeals Court to issue an interim order to the Commissioner General of Prisons and the Superintendent of Valikata Prison to prevent the implementation of the death sentence. During the proceedings, the Attorney General's Department pointed out that the Count of Appeal, or the Court of Appeal rather, does not have the jurisdiction to hear such a case against the President under Article 35 of the Constitution. The judgment said the concern can be flagged when preliminary objections are being considered. The court also decided to take up the petition seeking a court order preventing the implementation of the death sentence for consideration on the 2nd of next month. Now, in the meantime, Canada and Germany are also among the countries, along with the UK and the European Union, to urge Sri Lankan government to have a rethink about the indicated implementation of the death penalty. The High Commission of Canada and Sri Lanka says that this form of punishment is incompatible with human dignity and can lead to irreversible miscarriages of justice since no justice system is immune from error. Meanwhile, Germany's Commissioner for Human Rights, Policy, Humanitarian Aid at Foreign Office uh, Barbel Kofler, in a statement, expressed her deep concern over President Sirisena's public announcement of plans to follow through on four death sentences, while urging the Sri Lankan government to refrain from carrying out executions following a moratorium lasting more than 40 years. Kofler says executions would be a considerable setback along the path towards reconciliation and peaceful society. She goes on to say that the application of death penalty damages Sri Lanka's reputation, its ambitions in the area of human rights, and the country as a business location. Even though various countries have voiced their concerns over the president's stance on the death penalty, the head of state himself does not seem to be faced by it at all. The UK said President Maitripala Sirisena's move inevitably makes it more difficult for the UK to cooperate on law enforcement issues with Sri Lanka, while the European Union cautioned that Sri Lanka's GSP Plus facility could be in jeopardy. But the president revealed today that he even briefed the UN Secretary General as to what he penned 
as to why he penned the death warrants. The head of state was addressing an event in Polo Narwa this morning. The three-storied building of Lanka Puravijita Mahavidyalaya in Polonarva was vested with the students by President Maitri Palasiri Sena today. The building was constructed at an expense of 30 million rupees under the awakening of Polonarva district program. <laughs> You might have heard of me signing death warrants for four convicted drug racketeers. On Wednesday evening, the Secretary General of the United Nations contacted me from the United States over the signing of these warrants. He questioned me about the issues relating to drugs in the country. I told him that drug-related issues have worsened in Sri Lanka and that students of both schools and universities have been destroyed as a result. I explained to him that Sri Lanka has become a transit hub for drug trafficking. 60% of prisoner convictions in the country relate to drug offences. Prisons only have the capacity for 11,000, but we have 24,000 inmates, from which 15,000 relate to drug offences. Prisons only have the capacity for 11,000, but we have 24,000 inmates, from which 15,000 relate to drug-related offences. This is an extremely bad situation. To that end, I've decided to sign the death warrants. The country cannot be put on the right track without rigorous punishment. The reason behind the increased poverty rate in Sri Lanka is drugs. This isn't an indication of hatred or cruelty against an individual, but in fact, an act to save the educated young generation along with the country. <laughs> A considerable cache of weapons and explosives belonging to National Tauhid Jamaat were pried up by security services yesterday during an operation conducted in Katankudi. The search was worked off upon information provided by Mohammed Milhan, who was recently arrested in Saudi Arabia. Milhan was arrested along with four other affiliates of Easter Sunday terror ringleader Zahran Hashim on the 14th of this month. The Criminal Investigation Department arrested five persons, including Mohammed Milhan, who is believed to be the successor of Zahran Hashim in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia recently, in connection with the Easter Sunday attacks. A large haul of weapons and explosives were recovered yesterday through information and active directions provided by Milhan, who is currently under the custody of the Criminal Investigation Department. Among the items were 1,500 detonators, detonator wires, 369 gelignite sticks, liquid gelignite, ammunition used for T-56 firearms along with 62 swords. Meanwhile, Police Special Task Force conducted an investigation at a 25-acre training camp in Ominiyamaduwa in Riditanna of Walachena, which is suspected to have been operated by Zaran Hashim. A controversial figure pertaining to the Easter Sunday terror attacks. Former Minister Rishad Badiuddin testified before the Parliamentary Select Committee probing the attacks today as he was questioned over the alleged uh, involvement in the attacks. He is accused of aiding the terrorists and calls for his resignation, along with two other provincial governors, prompted the resignation of all Muslim ministers in the government. The chairman of the Select Committee, Ananda Kumar Siri, meanwhile read out a report submitted by the Acting Inspector General of Police on MP Badiuddin's links to terror activities. I would like to state with responsibility that I will never order such crimes and have never used Satosa vehicles for my personal needs. Alauddin is a businessman. We established the party in 2010 and he was appointed the treasurer. Later he became the vice treasurer. I asked him as to what happened when he met me following these incidents. He has a daughter who is married to a man connected to these incidents. That man had told his wife to leave for Mana with the father as he will be flying to Zambia. He was also dropped off at the airport by the wife. Two days after the explosions, the wife had come to know that he had lied to her and he was part of the attacks. Yeah, Zambia and me. Muslim <laughs> 
On the evening of the 26th, he messaged me saying his son was taken by an unidentified group. The next day, he arrived at my place and cried about it. Had the army commander told me that they are not involved, I wouldn't have contacted him twice. He said that he will check and get back to me. The father kept on asking me to check on his son. When I made the second call to the commander, he said that he couldn't check and asked me for his information. On the morning of the 28th, when I called the army commander, he told me that the boy was in their custody and that he will be handed over to either the TID or the police. ब्राहिमेंट ठीक है काल्या के तुम्हारे में व्यापार निशा मामा वेलंदे अमती निशा मामा तुम्हारे दान ना ये बाह आधुनिक ने कुमना आकारे की इंदर ये तुम्हारे इधर तो मैं इन्ना ना इंदला इंदला नीले साकच्चा वाली ना वा ये में नीले साकच्चा वा देदास दावत वर्षे दे तुम्हारे मामा समग्र साकच्चा करपो पिं नहीं तुम्हारे उब्ब आया माय तो नहीं कहीं लड़ारी एक द ये मैंने इतना उब्ब गिंग वेटुप गने नहीं लड़ारी एक द मुखाद्दे में बाल की में मां की ऐंड कहमत ही इब्राहिम हो इमरान के पुता हो काउरुत मगे आमाते आंसे किसी में ताना तुरो दरा गने हिटिए ना होंगे पुतुं नो बांधुरना दी टकले एक अपुता आरे अलाउड डीन के दुआ बिंदला हिटिए पुता अपना मामा दा अंदर नो एक ओह मजा दूर नहीं कोई आ करे मांगोल के दरा टमंगिया एक एम बस्सो अलाउड डीन के ने अपे पक्षिया उपा बांडा करे वशे गांधी मकाल हिटिए किल मैं मेवनिया अंतवादी खंडा या मक वार्धने व पिली बंदे व वो तुम आ दान्य कोई काली दलत है मैं एक बार मैं सिद्धि एम पासो तो मैं मंदे नगते सापोदरी ये टाइ वत्तले प्रदेश इंडिया मूल्य प्रदेश नियोसा ट्रस्टवादी नट कुलिये टलाबा दिलती बुना के लवार्ता उन्हें हम दुन्नद नंगी टा क्या क्या वत्तल है म there was a house of my sister's father-in-law and they left the house five years ago. It's owned by another sibling of theirs. He's the one who gives the house on rent. One person was on rent for a year, paying 60,000 rupees per month. I'll read out a letter by the acting IGP sent to the Secretary General of Parliament. It says that no information was recovered supporting the fact that Minister Richard Badiuddin is involved in the Easter Sunday spate of terror and any other terror activity. Parliamentarian Dayasiri Jayasekhar, however, gave an explanation as to why he will not be appearing before the Parliamentary Select Committee probing these two attacks during today's parliamentary sitting earlier in the day. According to standing orders of Parliament, if a case is being heard in court, discussing what is related to that case in the Parliament can be damaging to certain factions. The Attorney General has stated several times that since there are around five cases filed at the Supreme Court related to the Easter Sunday attacks, discussing about it can be damaging. Although he said several cases are filed in the Supreme Court related to the Easter Sunday attacks, there is not even one such case. He is talking about fundamental rights petitions and they're not legal cases. There are no cases filed against those who are related to this case. Today I am summoned to appear before the Parliamentary Select Committee probing the Easter Sunday attacks at 4 in the evening. I'm saying this since you're the leader of the House. I will not testify before this committee. He can't refrain from testifying. If he doesn't, action will be taken against him. He is not going since he is mixed up 
with the incidents that took place. Didn't you go to the police and get several suspects released? I gave a statement to the police regarding this incident. I didn't release anyone. What I did was stop a huge uproar. He is talking about this because he doesn't know what happened. That incident is not the reason why I'm summoned before the committee. Leader of the opposition, Mahinda Rajpaksha, personally believes that the death penalty should not be implemented and the president's timing of it is also not conducive. Responding to media following a function in Kamburpitiya today, the opposition leader said that he too was asked to pen death warrants during his tenure, which he declined. <laughs> I have always been clear that I do not personally agree with the implementation of the death penalty. We do not state in public, but the truth be told, this isn't the right time to implement it either. One should not become the president to provide job opportunities to a hangman. There is a court to do that. It does fall under the responsibilities of the president and he has done that by fronting the issue of drugs. However, this isn't the right time to do it. I too was asked to sign it during my tenure, but I did not. If one can become president by hanging people, then there are a lot to be hanged. I don't think the president made this move with that motive. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe says that an entire race should not be labelled as terrorists owing to actions of a few. While addressing public in Lagala this afternoon, the Premier reiterated that no mercy should be shown to terrorists. We have seen terrorism among Tamils and even among Sinhalese. Don't forgive this terrorism either. We should catch the ISIS members and should not let this terrorism spread. Action should be taken against those who spread extremism and not against everyone. When a fera called Taldiwe Somarama shot SWRD Bandarnaika, since he didn't want to blame the Buddhist clergy, he only said, a person clad in a yellow robe shot me, but urged not to make a commotion. Let's live according to the word of Lord Buddha. Now, members of the Buddhist clergy not only engage in extremism, but they also fast. A monk once told me members of the clergy engaging in fasts is disrespectful to Buddhism. When asked why, he said it is against the religion. It is evident that media can enlarge a small incident. Now, Speaker of the Parliament, Karu Jayasuri, is of the view that following the Easter Sunday attacks, Sri Lanka has to be a security-conscious nation. Lamenting that the nation became relaxed after the end of the conflict in 2009, he said that intelligence units of the country have to be strengthened and more training should be given. He expressed these views, addressing the event organised to uh, mark the launch of the National Police Commission's public complaint management system in Colombo today. The National Police Commission's public complaint management system was launched today under the patronage of Speaker Karuchai Surya. It enables members of the public to submit complaints via a web-based interface, streamline public complaint investigation process and strengthen monitoring, data analysis and reporting capacities of the NPC. In 2015, people voted for a government that promised a good governance and transparency. So that saw the birth of independent commissions, that saw the birth of uh, Flight to Information Act came in, and also we saw changes in many spheres in that uh, direction with regard to democratic governance. Police service is coming forward to give a better service to the people of this country. The acting Inspector General of Police spoke to me. We have to get more training to the people, especially after the Good Friday incident. We need to be more alert, and Sri Lanka has to be a a security conscious nation. I think we relax after the 2009 clearance of uh, terrorist activity. We took life easy and therefore we paid a very high price. And also our intelligence has to be increased and also we have to give more training. Strengthening independent commissions like the National Police Commission is critical in realizing the aspirations of the peace building priority plan of Sri Lanka. Developed in a highly participatory way in close consultation with the civil society and development partners. We must not allow the good work that has been done on reconciliation to go to waste at this timely juncture. We, you and us, all of us are now concerned about the growing number of incidents of hate speech being used in Sri Lanka. We believe that the police 
as the protectors of the rights of the people, should be conscious of the divisive nature of the hate speech and its ability to mobilize groups to violence. We must all remember that hate speech is an attack on the values of tolerance, inclusion, and diversity that fantastic Sri Lankans have been so proud to, uh, to hold. It undermines social cohesion and erodes our shared values, and it can set back progress made on peace and sustainable development. Timely initiatives such as this public complaint system being launched today will serve to build the public trust in independent state institutions. Effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions are important because they ensure that each citizen has access to justice. The Attorney General has filed indictments against former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahindran and nine others before the three-member permanent High Court trial at Bar. Coordinating Office of the Attorney General State Council Nishara Jayaratna stated that the Special High Court has summoned the accused before court on the 19th of July. The Attorney General had presented the indictments on, the, on 23 counts involving the charges against the suspects under the Public Property Act and registered Stocks and Securities Ordinance. Earlier this month, the Attorney General had requested permission from the Chief Justice to file indictments against 10 defendants over the Central Bank Treasury Bond scam with a permanent High Court at bar. On the 13th of this month, the Attorney General received the approval of the Chief Justice to hear the case before the Permanent High Court at Bar in the Western Province. There is more news on the other side of this short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, Sri Lanka tourism is confident that the industry will make a full recovery over the next several months. Chairman of Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau, Kishu Gomez, says that an aggressive plan is in place which goes beyond recovery. Speaking at an event held in Colombo yesterday, he said that the target is to achieve $10 billion in revenue over the next four to five years. If you ask me if country is safe now, I would say yes, it's safe to the extent it was prior to the, the attack, or Sri Lanka is as safe as any other tourism destination in the world. So given the magnitude, the seriousness of the, the incident, uh, I think we should be happy that we're being able to recover so fast. In that effort of regaining confidence from the, the rest of the world, I must mention here that it was the Thai delegation that came as the first delegation to visit the country after the attack. We as uh, Sri Lanka tourists are very, very confident uh, that we will fully recover over the next uh, several months. We will be on a more aggressive plan in order to try and hit $10 billion uh, revenue over the next uh, four to five years' time and go past uh, five million tourists over the, the same period. So that's the level of optimism we have uh, for which we are aligning other strategies. We are currently focusing on many, many activities very aggressively, effectively and successfully to be able to bring the numbers back. In fact, we are thinking going beyond just recovery, but competing, competing more aggressively to be able to keep growing the industry in line with the original objectives uh, we have been having. During first week of August, we will have a mega event for which we will have some big celebrities coming over to Colombo. Technically, security is in place. There is absolutely no issue, but uh, at the same time, you got to build the right perception as well. You got to get into the hearts and minds of uh, the tourists. There will not be uh, any opportunity for the same terrorist group or any other terrorist group uh, to be able to have another coordinated attack. The International Monetary Fund is of the view that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka should continue to follow a prudent data-dependent approach when adjusting policy rates as warranted by evolving macroeconomic conditions. Speaking at a media briefing yesterday, Assistant Director of IMF's Communications Department, Camilla Anderson, explained that Sri Lanka should follow the approach in monetary policy since the market conditions are getting normalized following the Easter Sunday attacks. Net foreign outflows from Sri Lanka's 
government securities market seem to continue, isn't it advisable for the Central Bank of Sri Lanka to re-enter the path of monetary tightening? Um, so on Sri Lanka, so on May 13th, the IMF's executive board completed the fifth review of Sri Lanka's 1.5 billion loan under the extended fund facility. And so far, we've dispersed 164 million. That agreement has included an extension of the program until June 2020 to help Sri Lanka anchor macroeconomic stability in the wake of those terrible terrorist attacks that were experienced by the country. So that's sort of where we are uh, on Sri Lanka. In terms of a specific response to the question, I would say that we would note that market conditions in Sri Lanka are normalizing. Indeed, on June 24th, the country successfully tapped the international bond market for $2 billion at 5- and 10-year maturities, and that issuance was well oversubscribed. In response to the specific question on monetary policy, we would say that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka should continue to follow a prudent data-dependent approach, adjusting policy rates uh, as warranted by evolving macroeconomic conditions. Now, Sri Lankan shares ended firmer at a more than one-week high today, buoyed by gains in beverage stocks, posting their first monthly gain this year. The benchmark stock index ended 0.51% firmer at 5,372.28, its highest close since the 20th of June. The index rose 0.16% for the week and posted its firm first monthly gain since December, rising 1.15%. Foreign investors bought a net 879.6 million rupees worth of government securities in the week ended on the 19th of June, but its net foreign outflows is at 20.7 billion rupees so far this year. We have Shawan Mendes from NDB Securities with a full report. During the week, the ASPI gained 0.2%, mainly due to price gains in counters such as Melster Corp, Distilleries and Union Assurance. Foreigners closed as net sellers, where foreign sales accounted for 28% of the total weekly turnover. A net foreign outflow of nearly 407 million rupees was recorded for the week. This resulted the year-to-date net foreign outflow to cross the 6 billion mark to record a 6.3 billion rupees. The Sri Lankan rupee ended at 178 rupees and 35 cents against the US dollar, being edged up on dollar sales as month and inward remittances surpassed importers' green back demand. The rupee dropped 16% in 2018 and was one of the worst performing currencies in Asia. With that, let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies around the world. Now then, Derana Lux Film Awards 2019 organized in recognition of the contributions made by the Sri Lankan artists of the Silver Screen is currently underway at the Nelum Pokna Theatre in Colombo. The award ceremony will ensure that artists and their good work will not be cast aside and that they are given due honour. The viewers will be able to witness the grand event at 9.30pm on TV Derana, so don't miss the opportunity. The 7th Derana Lux Film Awards First introduced in 2011, the Dharana Film Awards is being held for the seventh consecutive year. The Dharana Film Awards will feature three categories with 18 special awards by the jury. There are a cinema of tomorrow and seven popular awards. Actor, actress, and most popular actor. Awards will be presented to movies that hit the cinemas in 2018 by a panel of valid judges. The event will also be lit up by performances by nine popular artists of Sri Lankan cinema. Udari Pereira, Anusha Damanti, Umani Tilgaranda, Shishadri Priyasad, Chulakshi. Our viewers have the opportunity of watching the event as it will be telecast on TV Derana from 9.30 p.m. onwards today. News from around the world awaits on the other side of this break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, British Prime Minister Theresa May is adamant that suspects in the Salisbury Novichok attack should be brought to justice and Russia must stop its destabilizing activities. The UK believes two of officers from Russia's military intelligence service, the GRU, were behind the poisoning of former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in March of 2018. The Kremlin denies any involvement. Now, May and Russian President Vladimir Putin met for talks on the margins of the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan today in the first formal bilateral meeting between the two leaders since the 2018 attack. The two leaders shook hands, but there appeared to be little warmth, with May looking serious and unsmiling as the pair began their meeting. The meeting also comes as Putin dismissed the Skripal poisoning as fuss about spies and attacked liberalism, a core principle of Western democracy. Time to look at the World Cup. Now, Sri Lanka is bat battling to save their slender chance of qualifying for the semi-finals of the ICC Cricket World Cup. They are taking on South Africa, who has no chance of progressing to the next round. After being put into bat, Sri Lanka could only muster 203 runs all out with three deliveries to spare. Chasing 204 to win, the Proteas are currently on 126 runs for the loss of one wicket. And that's all from us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.